Unterhalter. The applicant was, together with the late Mr. W. Lewis, convicted of the murder of the late Mr. Tembisile Krisani in 1993, and they were sentenced to death. Their appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal failed. However, following upon the judgment of this court in S. v. Makonyane, which declared the death penalty unconstitutional, their death sentences were commuted to life imprisonment. The applicant is serving his sentence of life imprisonment at Jose Mampuru, the second correctional center. He had served about 26 years of his sentence of life imprisonment when the minister made the impugned decision in March 2020. He has now served about 28 years or so of his sentence. It is not necessary to deal with the circumstances under which the applicant committed the crime of murder of which he was convicted and for which he is serving a sentence of life imprisonment as they are well known. It suffices to say that when he and Mr. W. Lewis murdered the late Mr. Rani, Mr. Wani was the Secretary General of the South African Communist Party and was a prominent leader of the African National Congress, a husband to his wife and a father to his children. It is also important to refer to the types of remarks that the trial court made when it sentenced him as well as the remarks of the Supreme Court of Appeal when that court dealt with his and Mr. W. Lewis' appeal. Some of the remarks of the trial court were quoted by the minister in his decision document. They included the following, and I quote, in imposing the sentence of death, the trial court stated as follows, 13.4.1, the accused performed an act of assassination on a person who had attained prominence in public affairs in South Africa, whose killing was likely to the knowledge of the accused to cause far-reaching, highly emotive reactions with very damaging, serious consequences and extremely harmful effects for the entire society in South Africa. 13.4.2, the accused had ample opportunity for reflection and reconsideration, but carried on regardless. 13.4.3, the act was not performed impulsively and spontaneously, in immediate reaction to a specific event. 13.4.4, the assassination was planned over a period of many weeks with close attention to detail. 13.4.6, the murder was deliberate, was a deliberate cold-blooded one. It was preceded by weeks of planning. 13.4.7, the trial court wished to send out the message loud and clear to any who contemplates assassination of political leaders as an acceptable option. What view the court takes of such conduct? Close quotes. The Supreme Court of Appeal, when it dealt with the appeal lodged by 
the applicant and Mr. Deb Lewis at that time made among others the following remark quoted by the minister 13.5.1 and I quote few crimes can be regarded by a court as more atrocious or as being more calculated to arouse the revulsion of decent members of society than the sort of murder of which the appellants were duly convicted. The trial court ultimately concluded in that case, in the case of each appellant, that the death sentence was the only proper penalty. So, so far from being assailed by any doubts in the matter, I entirely agree with that conclusion. I will therefore confirm the death sentence. That is what, part of what the Supreme Court of Appeal said. <laughs> After the minister had made his decision to reject the applicant's application for placement on parole, the, applic the applicant brought an application in the Gauteng Division of the High Court to have that decision reviewed and set aside on the grounds, among others, that it was irrational. In the document containing the minister's decision, he made it clear that except for two factors, all the factors he was required to take into account in deciding whether to place the applicant on parole supported the placement of the applicant on parole. The two that the minister said did not support the applicant's application were the nature and seriousness of the crime on the one hand and the sentencing remarks that the court that had been made by the trial court when it sentenced the applicant on the other. In challenging the rationality of the minister's decision in the High Court, the applicant contended that he had met every requirement that he could meet in order to ensure that he improved his prospects of placement on parole, but there was nothing he could do about the nature and seriousness of the crime on the one hand and the sentencing remarks of the courts on the other. For that and other reasons, he submitted that the minister's decision meant that he would never be released on parole because those two factors would never change. The High Court rejected the applicant's contention. It said that the minister had considered all the factors he was required to consider and had placed upon each one of such each one of such factors, such weight as he considered appropriate. The High Court said that it was not up to it to place upon such factors the weight that it thought should be placed upon them. It accordingly dismissed the application with cause. The High Court dismissed the applicant's application for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. The applicant thereafter petitioned the Supreme Court of Appeal for leave to appeal, but that court too dismissed his application. In this court, the applicant, as already indicated, applies for leave to appeal against the judgment and order of the High Court. There were applications for leave to intervene that are now deal with. Famil Families for Life as NPO applied for admission as an intervening party in this matter. It is a non-profit organization which seeks to protect the interests of prisoners who serve life sentences and their families. The Families for Life as NPO apply apply for admission 
but it is quite clear from their papers that the purpose of their intervention is to deal with a number of issues relating to how parole is dealt with by the department and the minister, much more than the issues that are raised by the applicant in this case. For example, they want the whole parole system to be reviewed by which I understand them to mean that they want it to be reconsidered in its entirety. That falls outside the role and function of a court. That is a matter that they should take up elsewhere. For that reason, their application is dismissed. The South African Prisoners Organization for Human Rights also applied for leave to intervene in this matter, but it too raised issues that fall outside the ambit of this matter. It also wanted the whole parole system to be reviewed and complained in general about how the minister and the parole board made their decisions on parole applications. Its application also falls to be dismissed for the same reasons as the applications for for application for families for life as NPO. Mr. Deboko Modise also applied for leave to be admitted as an intervening party. His case is the same as that of families for life as NPO, and he also seeks the same relief as the families for life as NPO. His application is also dismissed for the same reasons. <clears throat> In this court, this court has concluded that it does have jurisdiction in this matter in the light of the fact that this is an appeal relating to a review application that was launched in the High Court. It has also concluded that it is in the interest of justice that the applicant be granted leave to appeal. The applicant persisted before us in challenging the minister's decision on the same grounds upon which he had challenged it in the High Court. The minister, Ms. Dimpo Hani, and the SACP opposed the applicant's application in this court as well, just as they had done so in the High Court and in the Supreme Court of Appeal. In considering the appeal, we have taken into account that in terms of Section 136 of the Correctional Services Act Number 101 of 1998, the applicant is one of those prisoners to whom the parole dispensation of the Correctional Services Act of 1959 applies, that is the 1959 Act. That provision is to the effect that a person who was serving a sentence of incarceration immediately before the commencement of chapters 4, 6, and 7 is subject to the provisions of the 1959 Act. That provision says that such prisoners will be considered for parole in terms of the policy and guidelines applied by the former parole board prior to the commencement of those chapters. Section 136.2 of the CSA, that is the Correctional Services of 1998, provides in effect that the prisoners whose parole dispensation is governed by the 1959 Act must be allocated maximum number, the maximum, maximum number of credits in terms of Section 22, capital letter A of the 1959 Act. Section 1863A of the CSA provides that a prisoner falling under this category must serve a minimum of 20 years of his sentence before he can be considered for placement on parole. Following upon the judgment of the Gauteng Division of the High Court in Fine Vague versus Minister of Correctional Services, 2012-1 SACR, 159 GNP, the then Minister of Correctional Services issued a policy document which provided that prisoners who were sentenced 
before 1 October 2004 should be eligible for consideration for parole after serving a minimum of 13 years and 4 months. As already indicated, the applicant fell into this category. The applicant completed 13 years and 4 months of his imprisonment in 2007, but as a result of presidential amnesties that he received, he obtained certain credits which reduced the minimum period he had to serve before being considered for parole by a whole year. The result was that the applicant became eligible to be considered for parole in 2005. Notwithstanding the fact that the applicant became eligible for consideration for parole in 2005, he does not appear to have applied for placement on parole until 2011. From 2011 until 2020, the applicant applied for parole on a number of occasions. I consider it important to refer to those applications and the outcomes thereof. In 2011, the applicant applied to be placed on parole. The parole board recommended that he be placed on parole. However, the minister responsible for correctional services at the time declined his request. The reason the minister gave was that the victim's family and other interested parties had not been given an opportunity to provide either a victim impact statement or a statement of opposition. On 30 May 2013, the applicant wrote a letter to Mrs. Honey in which he apologized. He did not receive any response to that letter. He, the applicant appeared before the parole board in November 2013. Mrs. Honey, her daughter, and their legal representative attended that hearing and made representations to the parole board. During the parole hearing, the applicant again apologized to Mrs. Honey. The applicant states that at that hearing, Mrs. Honey said that she did not accept his apology, but that if he wanted to approach her through her legal representative, he was welcome to do so. The applicant states that he respected Mrs. Honey's wishes as well as her decision at the time. After the parole board hearing, the applicant sent a further letter of apology to Mrs. Hani's legal representative, to which he received no response. Of course, Mrs. Hani was under no obligation to accept the applicant's apology. It is not clear from the record what the parole board's decision was on this occasion, but the applicant was not placed on parole. At some stage in the early months of 2015, the applicant attended a further parole board hearing. Once again, it is not clear what decision the board took this time. However, on 10 April 2015, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services at the time considered a further application for parole by the applicant and refused to place him on parole. The reason given by the minister for his decision was that the nature of the crime and the sentencing remarks of the trial court outweighed all the positive factors which counted in favor of the applicant's placement on parole. He recommended a restorative justice process and that the department should advise on security threats, if any, that might exist should the applicant be re released on parole. The applicant instituted a review application in the High Court to challenge this decision. The matter came before Janse van Nieuwenhuizen, J. The High Court rejected the reasons given by the Minister of Correctional Services at the time and concluded that his decision was unreasonable and irrational. Consequently, the High Court set the Minister's decision aside and ordered the Minister to place the applicant on parole. 
The minister took that judgment on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Appeal set it aside and ordered the minister to reconsider the applicant's application to be placed on parole. The issue in that appeal was whether the High Court had erred in reviewing and setting aside the, minister, the decision of the minister not to place the applicant on parole and to order the applicant's release on parole on the basis that it was irrational and unreasonable. It is remarkable that the Supreme Court of Appeal did not find fault with the judgment of Yansef and Neuven Hayes and Jay against which the minister had appealed, but it found fault with the minister's decision. The Supreme Court of Appeal ordered that Mrs. Honey's victim impact statement dated 30 October 2013 and the applicant's response thereto should be taken into account by the minister in reconsidering the applicant's application for parole. On 26 October 2017, there was another parole board hearing. Mrs. Honey and certain representatives of the SACP attended that hearing and made representations in support of their opposition to the applicant's application. It appears that the parole board made a recommendation to the minister, but the record does not reveal what the recommendation was. Upon a reconsideration of the applicant's application for parole on 17 November 2017, the Minister responsible for Correctional Services at the time again declined to place the applicant on parole. The reasons given by the Minister at the time can be summarized as follows. A. The applicant needed to undergo individual psychotherapy with a psychologist to assist in addressing his political ideologies which the minister at the time said had been highlighted as a risk factor in a psychologist's report. B, he had noted Mrs. Annie's statement that the applicant had not disavowed violence as a means to retaliate against communists. C, there were inconsistencies in the applicant's account of the circumstances that led to his decision to commit the offence. D, the applicant should participate in individual therapeutic programs with a social worker to enhance his social functioning skills. And E, it appeared that over the entire period of his imprisonment, the applicant had not acquired any academic or vocational skills that could enhance his prospects of reintegration into society, and the minister recommended that the department should assist the applicant to, to acquire any such appropriate skills. The applicant also successfully took this decision on review in the High Court. The High Court, through Judge Bakwa, reviewed the decision, set it aside, and remitted the applicant's application for parole to the minister to consider and decide it afresh. This was in September 2018. In January 2019, the minister responsible for correctional services at the time reconsidered the applicant's application to be placed on parole, following, up, following upon Judge Bakwa's judgment. Once again, the applicant's application was refused. The minister's reasons were that there were two conflicting reports of psychologists and this made it difficult for him to take a decision. He directed that the two psychologists should jointly assess the applicant and make a decision and file a joint report on the issues concerning risk and remorse. He also said that the applicant should undergo individual psychotherapy with a psychologist, with a psychologist in addressing challenges which have been highlighted in a report by one Ms. Zelda Badentach. The minister said that those challenges 
included depression and explosive anger episodes. The applicant also successfully took this decision on review in the High Court. That application was heard by just Judge Colapen, who set the minister's decision aside. Judge Colapen remitted the matter to the minister for a fresh decision within 60 days of the date of the order. On 16 March 2020, the minister made a new decision pursuant to Judge Golopin's order. Once again, the applicant's application was rejected. This is the decision which is the subject of these proceedings. When the High Court dealt with the review application brought by the applicant, it took the view that the minister had considered all the factors that he was required to consider in deciding whether or not the applicant should be placed on parole. It took the view that the minister had placed upon those factors such weight as he considered appropriate to place upon them and that it was not up to the court to place upon those factors such weight as it considered appropriate. It dismissed the applicant's application with costs and, as I indicated earlier on, refused leave to appeal. And I, as I indicated, the Supreme Court of Appeal also refused leave to appeal. The appeal before this court has to take into account the fact that the applicant was convicted of a very serious crime, that it was cold-blooded murder, that the applicant had been involved in planning the crime over a number of weeks and that his conduct nearly plunged this country into civil unrest and that in assassinating the late Chris Honey, the applicant and Mr. D.B. Lewis seemed to have been intent on derailing the attainment of democracy by this country. But those are not the only factors that this court must take into account. This court must also take into account the fact that the applicant falls into a category of prisoners whose parole dispensation is governed by the 1959 Act. And as I indicated earlier on, that the minimum period stipulated by legislation that the applicant and those who fall into the same category as him have to serve before they are considered for parole was 20 years. And the fact that the, a policy document that was issued by the then Minister of Correctional Services after the judgment of the Gauteng Division of the High Court in Van Rijk effectively required the applicant to have served 13 years and four months before he could be considered for parole. And then, and that in the light of the credits that he obtained as a result of presidential amnesties from which he benefited, ultimately he had to serve 
served 12 years before he could be considered for parole. The policy document referred to in section 136 of the CSA, which is part of the documentation that must be considered by the minister in making a decision on applications for parole, makes it clear that prisoners must be considered for parole as soon as possible after they become eligible for parole. The applicant became eligible for parole more than 17 years ago. It is now close to 20 years since he became eligible. During this time, it appears that he has applied for parole on a number of occasions as the summary that I gave earlier on reveals. And each time, his applications were rejected. The reasons that were given by the minister in, for the decision that is the subject of these proceedings were the nature and seriousness of the crime on the one hand and the sentencing remarks made by the trial court and the Supreme Court of Appeal on the other. Those reasons are the same reasons that were given by the then Minister of Correctional Services in 2015 when that minister rejected the applicant's application for parole which was taken on review successfully. The Minister of Justice and Correctional Services has made it clear that in considering the applicant's application, he concluded that all the factors except two counted in favor of the applicant being granted, being placed on parole, and the two that in his view did not count in favor of the applicant are the ones that I have mentioned. One of the matters that the minister has said is that he noted the applicant's commendable behavior throughout his day in prison. The minister has also made it clear that he accepts that the risk of the applicant reoffending if he were to be placed on parole is very low. <clears throat> The minister has also made it clear that he accepts that the applicant has shown remorse. In attacking the minister's decision as irrational, the applicant relied on, among others, the fact that the nature and seriousness of the crime of which he was convicted and sentenced. And the sentencing remarks of the High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal will never change in the future. The minister did not dispute this, nor could he. The applicant then went on to submit in his founding affidavit in the High Court that, that because these two matters on which the minister relied to justify denying him parole will never change in the future. The minister will never release him on parole, which therefore meant that he would serve a full life sentence of imprisonment. In pharmaceutical manufacturers, this court had this to say about the standard of rationality. It is a requirement of the rule of law that the exercise of public power by the executive and other functionaries should not be arbitrary. Decisions must be made, must be rationally related to the purpose for which 
the power was given. Otherwise, they are in effect arbitrary and inconsistent with this requirement. It follows that in order to pass constitutional scrutiny, the exercise of public power by the executive and other functionaries must at least comply with this requirement. If it, doesn't, if it does not, it falls short of the standards demanded by our Constitution for such action. Close quotes. This court went on to say in the same case, and I quote, the question whether a decision is rationally related to the purpose for which the power was given calls for an, an objective inquiry. Indeed, this court also said, and I quote, rationality in this sense is a minimum threshold requirement applicable to the exercise of all public power by members of the executive and other functionaries. Action that fails to pass this threshold is inconsistent with the requirements of our Constitution and therefore unlawful. The setting of this standard does not mean that the courts can or should substitute their opinions as to what is appropriate for the opinions of those in whom the power has been vested. As long as the purpose sought to be achieved by the exercise of public power is within the authority of the functionary, and as long as the functionary's decision viewed objectively is rational, a court cannot interfere with the decision simply because it disagrees with it or considers that the power was exercised inappropriately. In paragraph 13 of his answering affidavit, the minister set out the factors which he said he took into account in deciding the applicant's application, and I've mentioned some of them. The minister went on to say in paragraph 13.2 of his answering affidavit, notwithstanding the positive factors in favor of his, that is the applicant's placement on parole, I was in the light of paragraph 7.1.1, paragraph 7.2.1 to 7.2.2, and paragraph 7.4 to 7.5 above, enjoined to have due regard to the nature and seriousness of the crime of murder committed by the applicant and the remar remarks made by the court at the time. What emerges from a number of paragraphs to which the minister referred is that he considered himself enjoyed to consider the nature and seriousness of the crime and the remarks of the courts. I've already referred to some of the remarks that the minister relied upon, both of the trial court and then of the Supreme Court of Appeal. It will have been seen from the above what types of remarks that the, of the trial court and the Supreme Court of Appeal the minister took into account in deciding not to place the applicant on parole. The court's remarks he took into account relate to the seriousness of the offense that the applicant had committed or to the fact that the offense was well planned and was committed in cold blood. The question that arises is, are these the types of remarks made by a trial court at the time of imposing a sentence that the department's policy contemplates should be taken into account? In my view, they are not. And the minister conceived the remarks to which the policy refers. The sentencing remarks to which the policy document refers can only be remarks about the minimum period of imprisonment that a convicted person or offender should serve before he or she can be considered for parole. Sometimes judges and magistrates make remarks to such effect when they impose a sentence of imprisonment. If the reference to the sentencing remarks of the court referred to in the department's policy document is understood to be a reference to such remarks, the requirement in, po in the policy document makes sense. The remarks contemplated in the department's policy are the types of remarks this court had in mind in Jimale when it referred to the court's power to postpone the consideration of parole for sentenced prisoners. In short, the remarks contemplated by the policy document are remarks that 
judges and magistrates sometimes make when they sentence accused person to the effect that they should not be considered for parole unless and until they had they have finished a certain minimum period of their sentence. In the present case, neither the trial court nor the Supreme Court of Appeal made the types of sentencing remarks that are contemplated by the department's policy. That is understandable because the sentence that the trial court imposed on the applicant did not contemplate his return to society. He was sentenced to death. Therefore, the court had no reason to make remarks about the length of the period of imprisonment that the applicant had to serve before being considered for parole. Accordingly, in this case, there are no sentencing remarks of the type contemplated in the department's policy that the minister was entitled to take into account. This means that the factors recognized in the policy of the department as factors that should be taken into account that, according to the minister, did not support the release of the applicant on parole were only the nature of the crime and the seriousness thereof. The minister made the following important admission in paragraph 16 Point one of his answering affidavit. He said, and I quote, it is admitted that the factors mentioned in chapter six, open brackets one, capital A, close brackets, 19 of the Correctional Services B order, the so-called parole board manual, referred to in paragraph 7.1.3 to 7.1.6 above, were positive factors in favor of the placement of the applicant on parole. So too, the factors mentioned in the policy document referred to in paragraph 7.2.3 to 7.2.8 above. For purposes of my decision, I had due regard to such factors in favor of the placement of the applicant on parole. In his answering affidavit, the reference in paragraph, in this paragraph to the factors referred to in the paragraph I've just quoted is a reference to six of the eight factors that chapter six of the Correctional Services B order under the heading criteria for parole selection provides are to be taken into account in deciding whether an offender should be granted parole. In his answering affidavit, the minister said in effect that it was not his position that the applicant would never be released on parole. He never explained how he could release the applicant on parole in the future when the reasons that prevented him from releasing the applicant on parole in 2020 would still be present and would not have changed. That is the nature and seriousness of the crime and the sentencing remarks. What the minister says in effect is that in 2020, he was prevented by the nature and seriousness of the crime and the trial courts and Supreme Court of Appeals sentencing remarks from releasing the applicant on parole. But sometime in the future, he could release him on parole despite the fact that the nature of the crime, its seriousness and the court sentencing remarks would not have changed. Earlier, I pointed out the department's, that the department's policy requires that as far as possible, a prisoner should be placed on parole as soon as possible after he or she has reached the date when he or she can be considered for parole. In this regard, we must remember that the applicant's date when he became eligible to be considered for placement on parole was in 2005. The question that immediately arises then is this. If in the future the minister can or will release the applicant on parole on the same facts as those which prevailed in 2020 when he denied him parole, does that mean he will have reached two and mutually exclusive conclusion, conclusions on the same facts? If he could reach the conclusion to release the applicant on parole on these facts in the future, why is it that he did not release him in 2020 on the same facts? If the minister were to release the applicant on parole on the same facts in the future, how will he justify his two conflicting conclusions 
on the same facts. The minister did not explain any of this in his answering affidavit. His failure to explain this renders his decision to deny the applicant parole inexplicable. If it is inexplicable, it follows like night follows day that it is irrational. There is no connection between the exercise by the minister of his power and the purpose for which the legislation conferred that power on him. If there is no connection between the minister's exercise of the power and the purpose of the power conferred upon him, his decision is irrational. One can put what I've said in the preceding paragraph in a different way. That is that if more than 26 years after the applicant was sentenced for the crime he committed, it was appropriate for the minister not to release the applicant on parole in 2020 because of the nature of the crime, the seriousness, the seriousness thereof, and the court sentencing remarks, why would it be appropriate for the minister to release him one or two or three or five years thereafter? These three factors are immutable. They will not change one or two or three or five years later. This the minister has indicated has not explained, notwithstanding the fact that it cried out for an explanation because the applicant clearly put it in issue. Therefore, this court must vitiate the minister's decision. If it were not to do so, it would in effect be giving its approval to the proposition that in future it would be appropriate for the minister to deny the applicant parole even when he may have served 30 or 35 or even 40 years of imprisonment. That simply on the basis of the nature of the crime, the seriousness thereof, and the child courts and the Supreme Court of Appeals sentencing remarks, despite the fact that the applicant has complied with all other requirements for him to be placed on parole, which the minister concedes. The minister's decision is not rationally connected to the purpose of the power conferred upon him. His decision is therefore irrational and it falls to be reviewed and set aside. Having concluded that the decision is the minister's decision is irrational and falls to be reviewed and set aside, the next question is whether this court should remit the matter to the minister to consider the, to consider the applicant's application for parole afresh in the light of this judgment, or whether this court should order the minister to place the applicant on parole on such terms as may be appropriate, excuse me, may be appropriate in all of the circumstances. Ordinarily, this court would remit the matter to the minister and direct that he considers the applicant's <coughs> application for parole afresh and make a decision on whether or not the applicant should be placed on parole. That route enables the court to allow the functionary in whom the power to make it a certain decision vests to make the decision whether or not the applicant should be released on parole. However, it is not our law that a court will not, under any circumstances, either make the decision itself that was supposed to have been made by the functionary concerned, or that it can never order such a functionary to make a, decision, a particular decision. The courts in this country appreciated this even before the advent of democracy. In Traub, Judge Goldstone concluded that the decision of the administrator of Transvaal or the hospital authorities involved in that case uh, not to appoint the applicant, Dr. Traub, as a senior house officer, fell to be reviewed and set aside. The High Court then had to consider whether to remit the matter to the relevant functionary to decide her application for appointment as a senior house officer or to make that decision itself. The High Court concluded after referring to Agricultural Supply Association that it was permissible for the court to make the decision itself where the decision was a foregone conclusion. In that case, Goldstone J said, and I quote, in my opinion, we, the question which must determine which of these two causes I should follow 
is primarily whether the result of a further reference back is a foregone conclusion. Put in another way, I must consider whether on all the facts of this case it will be reasonable for an unbiased, intelligent person to refuse to appoint the applicant to the position sought by her because she is not suitable for that appointment. Close quotes. The court in that case ultimately made an order directing the relevant functionaries to take all necessary steps to cause Dr. Chaub to be appointed to the position of a senior house officer at Baragonath Hospital, Soweto. After the advent of democracy, this continued to be the legal position. It is important to emphasize that courts only substitute their decisions for those of, of government functionaries in exceptional cases. It is not something the courts do lightly, nor should they. Section 8 of PAJA deals with remedies in judicial reviews. In so far as it may be relevant, Section 8 provides, and I quote, the court or tribunal in proceedings for judicial review in terms of Section 6.1 may grant any order that is just and equitable, including orders C, setting aside the administrative action, and Roman figure one, remitting the matter for reconsideration by the administrator with or without directions, or Roman figure two, in exceptional cases, double A, substituting or varying this administrative action or correcting a defect resulting from from the administrative action. In Trencon, this court dealt extensively with circumstances in which it would be justified for a court not to remit a matter to the relevant functionary, but instead to itself make the decision that the law vests in the, in the functionary. It is not necessary for purposes of this judgment to deal with all those exceptions it should suffice to refer only to one or two. Kampembe J, writing for a unanimous court in Trencon, said, and I quote, pursuant to administrative review under section six of PAJA and one administrative action, and once administrative action is set aside, section 8.1 affords courts a wide discretion to grant any order that is just and equitable. In exceptional circumstances, Section 81C Roman Figure 2AA affords a court the discretion to make a substitution order. Section 81C Roman Figure 2AA must be read in the context of Section 81. Simply put, an exceptional, an exceptional circumstances inquiry must take place in the context of what is just and equitable in the circumstances. In effect, even where there are exceptional circumstances, a court must be satisfied that it would be just and equitable to grant an order of substitution. One of the exceptions recognized in Trencon is where the decision is a foregone conclusion. This court went on to say, to my mind, given the doctrine of separation of powers, in conducting this inquiry, there are certain factors that should inevitably hold greater weight. The first is whether a court is in as good a position as the administrator to make the decision. The second is whether the decision of an administrator is a foregone conclusion. These two factors must become considered cumulatively. Thereafter, a court should still consider other relevant factors. These include delay, bias, the incompetence of an administrator. The ultimate consideration is whether a substitution is just and equitable. This will involve a consideration of fairness to all implicated parties. It is prudent to emphasize that the exceptional circumstances inquiry requires an examination of each matter on a case-by-case -case basis that accounts for all relevant facts. A period of more than 15 years has lapsed since the up 
applicant became eligible for consideration to be placed on parole. It was in 2005 that the applicant became eligible to be considered for placement on parole. The minister accepts that the applicant has shown remorse for the crime he committed. The evidence reveals that during his imprisonment all these years since 1993, the applicant has had no negative disciplinary record in prison. The minister accepts that the applicant's risk of reoffending if he were to be released, placed on parole is low. The applicant has apologized to Mrs. Sani and her family more than once. The applicant cannot do anything about the nature of the crime he committed, its seriousness, nor can he do anything about the sentencing remarks that the trial court had made about him and the crime of which he was convicted. With regard to the fact has the minister took into account against the applicant the fact that if the applicant were placed on parole, he would serve only a period of two years of his life sentence should not have been taken into account. This is because that is a benefit that the law has given to the prisoners falling in the same category as the applicant, and he is entitled to benefit from the law. In this regard, it must be remembered that Section 91 of the Constitution declares that everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and benefit of the law. In my view, this court is in as good a position as the minister to determine whether the applicant should be released on parole. The other factor that should be taken into account in deciding whether to remit the matter to the minister or to, add a, to order the minister to place the applicant on parole is the history of the matter. That history reveals that not only has the applicant served 28 years of imprisonment of his life, imprisonment sentence, but he has complied with all that he, with all that the various ministers of correctional services and the parole board have required of him, have required him to do in order to improve his prospects of being granted parole. For over a decade, the applicant made numerous applications for parole and various ministers responsible for correctional services rejected his applications for one reason or another. On a number of occasions, the applicant to the high, applied to the High Court to challenge the various ministers' decisions denying him parole, and he succeeded in, in all of them except the one that is the subject of this judgment. Even in this one, as will have been seen above, he should have succeeded. In all those applications, except one, the court remitted the matter to the minister responsible for correctional services to consider the applicant, applicant's application for parole afresh. And each time, the various ministers reached the same conclusion as they had reached before, namely to reject his application for parole. The one occasion when the High Court did not remit the matter is referred to has been referred to above. That is where Judge Newvenhausen J set aside the minister's decision and ordered the applicant to be placed on parole, but the minister took the judgment on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, ordered him to consider the victim impact statement of uh, Mrs. Honey and other interested parties. The history of the applicant's applications for parole reveals that as far back as 2011, the parole board recommended that he be released on parole, but the then minister responsible for correctional services re rejected the recommendation. That history also reveals that in the one court application which the court did not remit the matter, the court ordered the minister to release the applicant on parole, as I've indicated. In the present case, the minister has considered all the factors that should be considered in deciding whether to place the applicant on parole, and has concluded that except two, they all supported the conclusion that the applicant should be released on parole. The two factors that the minister considered to count against the applicant are the ones discussed above, which I have concluded 
can no longer stand in the way of the release of the applicant. I have reached this conclusion against the background that the applicant served more than 25 years of his sentence of life imprisonment, during which he has kept a clean disciplinary record and has complied with every requirement he has been told by the prison authorities he should comply with in order to improve his prospects of placement on parole. In the circumstances, I'm of the view that it is just and equitable that this court should order the minister to place the applicant on parole. In considering whether or not the applicant should be released on parole, I've been mindful of the fact that in assassinating Mr. Hani, the applicant sought to derail the attainment of democracy in this country and nearly plunged South Africa into a civil war. However, I've also borne in mind that the fathers and mothers of our constitutional democracy, I'm going to repeat that. However, I've also borne in mind that when the fathers and mothers of our constitutional democracy drafted our constitution and included in it the Bill of Rights, they did, they did not draft a Bill of Rights that would confer fundamental rights only on those, only on those who fought for democracy and not on those who had supported apartheid or who were opposed to the introduction of democracy in this country. They drafted a Bill of Rights that conferred fundamental rights on everyone, including those who had supported apartheid with all their hearts. Indeed, they drafted a Bill of Rights which conferred fundamental rights even upon visitors to our country, so that upon entry into our country, they begin to enjoy the benefits and protections of our Bill of Rights. That is why the preamble to our Constitution reads in part, and I quote, We, the people of South Africa, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this Constitution as the supreme law of the Republic so as to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice and fundamental human rights. Lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Build a, a united and democratic South Africa, able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations." Close quotes. Furthermore, most of the sections in our Bill of Rights start with the phrase, everyone has a right. That is because the fundamental rights conferred in those sections are conferred on everyone. In the result, the following order is made. One, leave to appeal is granted. Two, the appeal is upheld. Three, the decision of the Gauteng Division of the High Court, Pretoria, dismissing the applicant's application is set aside and replaced with the following. A, the decision of the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services made in March 2020 rejecting the applicant's application for parole is reviewed and set aside. B. The Minister of Justice and Correctional Services is ordered to, to place the applicant on parole on such terms and conditions as he may deem appropriate and to take all such steps as may need to be taken to ensure that the applicant is released on parole within 10 calendar days from the date of this order. C, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services is ordered to pay the applicant's costs, including the cost of two counsel. Four, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services must pay the applicant's costs in this court, including the cost of two counsel. 
as well as the applicant's cost in the Supreme Court of Appeal in respect of the petition for leave to appeal. I hand down the judgment. As the court pleases, Chief Justice and other justices. Thank you. As the court pleases, Chief Justice and other justices. Thank you. As the court pleases, Chief Justice and the other justices. Thank you. As it pleases the court, Chief Justice and other justices. Thank you. The court will now adjourn. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>